Hey, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. This week we've got Ryan Fair from the Cleveland Indians strength coaching staff joining us. Ryan is one of the minor league strength coordinators for the Indians, which means he oversees all of the the spring training and the in-season and off-season training for all the minor leaguers. So really big job. He's the guy saying, here's what everyone's going to be doing. Here's where everyone's going, helping to manage and coordinate all of the activities of the strength coaches that work alongside of him. Ryan started as an intern, worked his way up, and has been with a couple different organizations. And his journey to the what is a really high-up role within the strength and conditioning world uh, started with a lot of unpaid work and really just elbow grease getting in the trenches and training on athletes. So he's going to talk a lot about his story and how he got there, which I think there's tons of great lessons in there for young young athletes and young coaches in the industry who sometimes want to rocket up the ladder without putting in their time and without putting in some of that grungy, grimy uh, intern type work. And the other thing that we're going to touch on today is a little bit about mental health and the athlete community. So this is one of those things that's kind of taboo. It shouldn't be. But it's often not talked about, but we got deep into it today, so make sure you stick around to the last third of this episode where we talk about some of Ryan's struggles that he really wanted to share because it's one of those things that if we all keep it inside, no one gets better. Ryan's very open and candid because he wants to see change in the industry and he wants to see athletes feel like they can go and turn to someone and get the help that they need uh, if they're struggling during a season. So we're going to jump into this now, so welcome my guest, Ryan Fair. Hey, Ryan. So you were out there in Arizona. How's the weather, man? Hey, Dan. I appreciate you having me, man. It's uh, right. Actually, today it was freezing. I mean, by by a Floridian standards or, or somebody like myself, I lived in Florida most of my life and then uh, been out here in the desert with the, all the time that I wasn't in Florida. And so I'm used to the hot. So it's about 55 degrees today. Ew. Felt like it was oh, felt like man. it was about 10 degrees. Um, but yeah. you know, we just had a our version of that polar vortex or whatever comes through. So I, I, we'll, we'll get a little warmer weather here. But uh, otherwise, otherwise, not not too bad here. Man, your life's so hard. Oh, 55. Wow. My heart really goes out to you, Ryan. Really goes out to you. It was hey, I had to wear pants was... today, man. That's tough. That's tough. Yeah, well, they were probably Lulu pants, and you're they're, you're probably still sweating. I have no sympathy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, you actually got me. I did wear Lulu pants. So you got yeah. me. <laughs> you're, a ba- you're a baseball guy. You have to. Like, there's no other. That's like the uniform. That's, that's like the thing now, isn't it? Like, if, if you play, like, that's how I recognize professional baseball players in the Phoenix area. They have to be wearing Lululemon. And if they are, then there's, a, there's probably like a 75% chance that they're a professional baseball player. Dude, you're, it's, you're spot on. It's like cult status. I had the same revelation uh, at Sabre Seminar two years ago. And uh, I don't know if you were cross paths with Mike Reinold, but uh, I had two buddies there who were former minor leaguers and Mike and myself. And we might have been the only four, like form. no, we weren't the only, but we are like four former like baseball guys in the audience you know less on like the the analytics side and we were all wearing lululemon pants and like three of us were wearing the same color of gray and we're like we're such like losers we're in the same lulu club just labeling ourselves yes it's so funny like because there's a there's a lulu outlet actually like i don't know probably 15 minutes from here and you just not a day goes by at our complex where guys not like yeah, I think I'm going to hit up the Lulu outlet today when we get done. <laughs> it's, it's actually pretty funny. It's just an addiction. But, hey, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I know you're about to get uh, going full speed ahead, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I appreciate you having me. This, it's actually great, great timing for us to talk about because we are, I mean, we're basically, I don't know, what are we, a week and a half out? We're about a week out from pitchers and catchers reporting uh, on, the, on the big league side, and we're, we're exactly two weeks to the day from our first report of, uh, of minor leaguers coming in so our you know our early reporters so uh, we we have guys in the building i think every day we we have another you know two three four guys showing up we have rehabbers in the building we have we have a lot going on so things are pretty busy but it's actually exciting because you know the moving truck comes in and some of the the, the staffs are starting to arrive so you know the, the building's getting full it's, it's exciting but this is honestly the perfect time for us to sit down and cut up some time to talk to the shop because it's, it's right before it's that little bit of calm right before the storm yeah i bet so yeah, the the trucks. I, I saw the uh, all the tweets and everything. Oh, the trucks packed. You know, we got eighty six bats and twenty thousand baseballs and eighteen pairs of Lulu pants and you know they're they're, they're they got all the, the the essentials on there. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely had to get the Lulu pants on there. But but, but yeah, I mean you got you got the cars getting delivered. All the players' cars are coming in. I mean it's just that time of year again, man. But it's it's exciting. You know the 
I saw everybody's tweets the second the Super Bowl ended. It's officially baseball season, so I'm excited. Yeah, and it was even like a baseball score for the Super Bowl, so it felt kind of fitting. Yeah, yeah that was uh, quite appropriate. So walk me through. We'll kind of double back um, to how you got here, but real quick, I'm curious to see, you know, you're getting going, but like what does spring training look like for you before we kind of go back and fill in how you made it uh, to be one of the, the Indians' uh, strength coaches? So tell me, take me through spring training that gets going in a week. Yeah, so every year has been a little bit different for me as, as my as my role has evolved with the organization. So I'm going into what is officially my third spring training with the tribe. Now, my first year, I was only really there for half of it. I got kind of I got hired halfway through, uh, but but this year, a lot of the a lot of it's going to be about scheduling for me um, and just making sure operations are running smoothly as far as the, the strength strength staff goes. Because uh, you know, in in part of my role as, as being the performance coordinator for our Arizona complex with spring training running out of our complex, you know, I'm one of probably two or three people or I would say, yeah, two to four people on the, on the strength and conditioning side that, that need to ensure that it's everything from assessments to training, to conditioning, to recovery modalities, all of those things, uh, data collection, make sure those things are all on track and, and running smoothly throughout the year. So spring training, you know, this, this being probably my first go around with a role that's, really focused on the administrative side uh, quite a bit less than, than it has been in the past, where a lot of it in the past was more being on the floor and coaching the majority of my time. With, with this being a first year of a little bit of a change, you know, it's, it's going to be something that's so, sort of new for me, but a little bit of a new experience. But uh, essentially, I mean, it's going to be, you know, we, we bring in waves of players every every week, you know, basically from next week on, where we, like I said, our pitchers and catchers from the big league club will report. Uh, then we'll get position players from the big league side. We'll get our, our early, early camp guys. On the minor league side coming in, and we'll get minor league pitchers and catchers, then the rest of the reporting players, and then we're in full swing. And at that point, you know, we're about a week or two out from playing minor league games, and 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 then before you know it, spring spring training's over. But you know, with a, over 180 players in the building, everybody trying to get training sessions in, games, uh, you know, speed work, fundamental work. It's um, it's it's a big operation, but it's but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so your job description, you're a coordinator, and what is that? You said you're not on the floor as much, so I'm sure that's, like you said, it's a big change for you. Um, do you do a ton with the major league guys and mostly with the minor league guys, or, like, what's the what's the scope of the job? Yeah, so to break it down, I, I say, as far as I know, and, you know, this is just from I've been with a couple other organizations and then just, just talking with, with networking with other coaches in professional baseball. I think the Indians are one of the old, one of the handful of teams that, that actually run it this way in that we have uh, multiple minor league strength and conditioning coordinators. So, so uh, traditionally, they, you would have a minor league strength coordinator who would, who would oversee the entire strength and conditioning department for the minor league. And then you have a major league strength coach um, and his assistant. Um, so what we do is we, we have a, uh, a performance coordinator – here in Arizona, that, that's, that's me filling that role, uh, what I've been doing for the last two years. We have a, an affiliate level performance coordinator, so he's overseeing basically short season A ball all the way through AAA um, and the coaches that are, that are there. And then we have a, a Dominican Republic Academy coordinator who runs the same operation, same type of job description down in our Dominican uh, Academy. Um, and then we work together with the Major League Strength Coach, the, the farm director, uh, to, to, to run the, the strength conditioning for the for you know, the minor league system. So, um, you know, like I touched on, for, for me, every year it's, it's just evolving more and more. Um, so when I first took on this job as, as the coordinator, uh, I was just learning that side of it, so the leadership and management side, the scheduling. I mean, I, I really had no idea what I was doing there. But my day-to-day was serving uh, our rehab players. So uh, I would spend time with basically all of our long-term rehab projects or, or players that were sent to Arizona for their recovery. Uh, everything from 16-year-old uh, international players all the way up to, you know, 30-year-old big league vets. If they came to Arizona for their for the rehab process, I was overseeing the, the strength and conditioning for that. So um, did that for two years, slowly took on more of the administrative stuff. And then going into year three, the, the shift a little bit here is that I'll be predominantly responsible for the, our 40-man rehab players. So all the guys are on the 40-man roster that are doing long-term rehab. Um, I'll take care of them on the floor. Uh, but outside of that, my only other time on the floor will just be supporting our other coaches that are there. So I'm on the floor every day, but I'm able to dip in and out, um, you know, as I need to or as, as the coaches need me in different areas. 
uh, spending a lot more time not only on just the administrative side, but also on sports science. And again, it's almost like I was where I was at two years ago where I came in and had never really done any of the administrative stuff before. Uh, yeah. I'd never really taken on sports science before in, in my life. And, and so now I'm learning as much as I possibly can to become entry level at, at that part of my job. So um, that's kind of how it's shifted for me. And, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun because I, when I do get to coach and when I am around athletes, I'm around, like I said, everything from a 16 year old. So it goes, makes it feel like I'm back at the high school level, which was one of the most fun times of my life uh, coaching at that level all the way up to, to, to some of our big league guys. So I get really a uh, diverse opportunity to, to reach and, and interact and build relationships with all different types of people. And it's, it's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. I'm sure you have a really cra- That's a really big, age range i mean you're 16 year old kids right out of the dominican republic who you know and other countries who have a a training age of you know perhaps zero as far as like the formalized stuff maybe but then you have you know 40 year old veterans who are you know clue bots and and, uh you know machines so that's a pretty interesting population that you've got so before i I have like a million questions uh before i like bombard you with them let's go back and because you're only 20 you're turning 26 I got that right, right? You're turning 26. 26, turning 27, but, but it's, all, it's all the same. It's almost 30. So Tur- Turning 27, yeah. <laughs> it we're feels both, like anyway. Yeah, we're both rapidly aging. But you have a pretty high up job for a pretty young guy. So could you fill our listeners in on how you got there? Yeah, yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's just been an awesome journey. I hope I don't spend too much time on it. I don't, I don't want to bore anybody, but it's been a fun one for me. It's been really rewarding. Um, basically, you know, I'm a baseball lifer, kind of like anybody that's listening to this podcast and really everybody that I get to work with. So, um, started playing when I was four years old, played all the way, you know, I was, I was a single sport kid, not, not because, you know, I was any good at it, not because I was forced to, I just loved baseball. That's all I ever wanted to play. So I, I played from four until 18, uh, played through high school ball. And, and basically by like my junior senior year, I kind of just knew that at, at five foot 10 throwing, you know, 82 as a righty. Like probably didn't have a lot of a lot of prospects to play collegiately at a high level. Um, did not know what uh, you know I know and what others know now about training, um, but I knew that I loved training, even though I was doing all the wrong stuff. So uh, I knew I wanted to coach. wasn't sure if I wanted to be a pitching coach one day or 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 strength coach, but I just knew I wanted to coach. So uh, as soon as as soon as I graduated from high school, my my head coach Rick Sperling at the Land High School actually. Uh, uh, Part of ways with the way in high school, they brought in a new head baseball coach, Andy Lyon. Uh, I happened to be working out at the high school weight room the summer after I graduated from Deland High, and uh, I happened to cross paths with the new head baseball coach as he was getting a tour of of the uh, of the facilities. Um, and so I met Andy and introduced myself. I said, hey, you know, like I'm going to be in the area going to a JUCO for a year. I, I would love to, you know, I'd, I'd love to help out in any way I can. And, and he goes, well you know, would you like to throw BP tomorrow to our freshman team? And so uh, I was, you know, like I said, I wasn't the greatest pitcher in the world as it is. And I threw cutters and I'd never thrown BP in my life. So I was like, <laughs> sure, why not? Um, so scared to death. I went out there and threw the freshman team the next day and kind of the, the rest of history. I, I, I don't think I took a day off from, from coaching alongside Andy Lyon for the next four years after that. So, uh, you know, I, I completed my one year at, at, at Daytona State College, finishing my uh, AA um, and then, then transferred to the University of Florida, uh, studying exercise science there. But I, I did my degree completely online from the University of Florida because it, it was about two hours away, and I didn't want to relocate because after just a, a year of coaching baseball at the way in high school with Andy Lyon, I knew it would be very hard for me to find opportunities to coach like that somewhere else and try to reestablish kind of the, the roles that I had there because at 18 or 19 years old, I was getting to coach athletes every single day, uh, I was building credibility with him. I was obviously, I was, I was, you know, sweeping the sheds, rake, raking the field, you know, watering the field, hanging windscreen, stocking concessions. Like I did all the dirty work and I did it for, for no money alongside some of, you know, my, my lifelong best friends now, guys that, that I was learning from every single day, the other coach, the coaching staff we had there. Um, but I also got an opportunity to coach and it was invaluable um, every day. You know, I was the JV pitching coach. I was the varsity bullpen coach. And then I, Slowly over the years, you know, I went from running warm ups to, you know, leading strength and conditioning, you know, weight room sessions and recovery sessions and didn't have a clue what I was doing. But every day that I was doing self study and reading and, and studying and what I was learning in school, like I was able to apply it. So 
like I said, it was invaluable four years. Um, I also you know, had the opportunity in that time uh, to work at Stetson University, uh, which they had just started their strength and conditioning program my sophomore junior year uh, of school. So uh, was in the Durant area. That's my hometown. That's where, where Stetson is. Um, they had started up their football program for the first time in 50 years. It, it had been shut down. And so they started a strength program, built a weight room. And so I happened to just have great timing, went, went to the director there. I didn't even realize that that, that program was new and just said, hey, I would love to volunteer. We'd love to just observe. And he goes, well, we just started a month ago. I, you know, I, I don't have any interns. I have no assistants. Come tomorrow morning and help me coach. Uh, I, I believe the next morning was uh, women's softball or was softball. So I was like, yeah, sure. And uh, sure enough, you know, I got to coach there for, for a semester um, and basically was an assistant because there just was nobody else. And there was a lot of work to be done. So, I had, again, another opportunity to just, just to coach and coach a lot, learn a lot, fail a ton, um, but, but continue to learn from those things and grow. So um, jumping ahead, continue coaching high school baseball. And then my senior year had the opportunity uh, to get an internship with the LA Dodgers, flew out here to Arizona for the first time, spent three months out here and kind of just another way that, that, that the, the cards, you know, I, I got very fortunate. Um, I had an opportunity to spend two or three weeks alone at, at our short season affiliate up in Ogden, Utah, um, and, and take care of that team by myself, even as a college student, just because of uh, s- some circumstances that came up with the other strength coaches on staff. Uh, so I finished my internship with a minor league team of my own and then flew home and, and, and you know, thank the Lord, you know, upon finishing that, I was offered a full-time job pending my graduation. So I graduated from the University of Florida and, and started my professional coaching career. So um, just, just speeding along, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot here, um, but – Hey man, the, the reason you're here is to to talk, to share. Like that's a great story, and to to cut in, I think there's a lot of kids today who don't realize how much unpaid work there is to get to high places. Like I think everyone thinks that they're just gonna graduate and then get a full time job, but you put in like what six years of unpaid hard work just to like learn and get better. I mean that's that's a really important like take home lesson for not only kids. But, you know, high school seniors and people who want to be you, who want to work in Major League Baseball, I don't think they realize how much they have to just put themselves out there and and work, perhaps without pay, knowing that it's going to pay off in the future, you know, with all the skills and the experience that they gain. Yeah, oh my gosh, Dan. I mean, that's, that's honestly, like, that's probably the greatest, you know, lesson I could give to somebody who's asked, who asked me, you know, like, how can I – how can I speed up my growth as a, as a strength coach or just as a coach in general? And I would just say, get, get in the trenches as soon as you can work for free. If, if you're able to, um, I mean, Dan, and I, I put it in not only those four years there at the high school level, but every, you know, I spent the next few years, I spent some time in professional baseball and in the off seasons, I came home and coached for free for Andy Lyon, both years he, he had moved on to Lake Howell high school and, and I went back and would spend the entire offseason training the kids at Lake Howell High School, spending every day on the yard, suiting up for games, wearing baseball pants, doing raking the field, doing it all because, one, because I love it and because I love the kids. And, and, more, and, and really, like, almost just as importantly, I love the staff that, that, I've, that I've worked with, and I love coaching alongside great coaches um, that care about the kids. But also because I just needed the experience. I just knew I needed to build it. And, and it was never – I don't know that it was ever consciously for my resume. I just knew that that was going to probably offset not having a master's degree. And it was going to be the thing that hopefully put me ahead of other people down the road because I was just getting an opportunity to run into all these different scenarios. So everything from dealing with parents to, to dealing with kids that are, you know, their girlfriend broke up with them and their life sending, um, you know, all those things of getting the opportunity to see those things and deal with them. And, and you just, I, I don't know. I think I would have paid people to do that, let alone, you know, I, I don't think I would have asked for a dime. So it, 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 it was, it paid dividends for me. I think, honestly, I, I don't know for sure, but I think that's, you know, how I've been able to get to where I am now. Well, I'm sure it was. And I'm sure that getting those internships, like it's not even easy to get a, an internship with an MLB team. And so, you know, when you work for somebody and, and I've seen it with my own life because I did the same thing. You know, when I was in college, I studied philosophy. They didn't have – I studied philosophy for a lot of reasons, but one was that they didn't offer exercise science or nutrition, and I wasn't interested in either of those things until 
a little bit later in my college career where it was kind of like, oh, I've developed a passion for, for training and like, you know, performance and all this stuff, but it's, you know, my junior year. So I'm kind of out of luck. So I did internships that were unpaid. I did one with uh, the Ravens strength coach at the time, Jeff Friday, and that one wasn't a long one, but I went and just observed him and learned from him. And I did one for better part of two years with Nick Tuminello, who's a, a T Nation writer. He's a guy who, you know, coaches all over the world, does seminars in Australia and New Zealand, like all over the country, over the, over the planet. And all that was unpaid. It wasn't even related to my major. And it was just because I wanted to learn stuff. And those were huge, like formative experiences. And, and, and those guys, and uh, I think I did one other, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but, but like Nick especially was a mentor. And if I ever needed something, he would vouch for me to anybody because I showed up like you did and just worked, you know? And, and I think I'm sure your, your coaches at Deland, they'd be like, yeah, you need to hire this guy, Ryan. Like th- listen, listen to what he's done for us for no pay for four years. Like, I mean, that's, that's bigger than any resume. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, man. And, and I think I think you hit on a couple things, and I I think obviously just the work ethic is it's just got to be there. I mean, if, if that's there, you know, that's going to be displayed by your 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 desire to work, um, and and willingness to do it for little to no pay, and do it for the you know sixty seventy hours <laughs> in addition to schoolwork or what whatever else you have going on, or working another job that will pay the bills. Um, I think just being a good person goes a long way too. Um, so those are things like when, when I when I'm talking to, to younger coaches and or the, the the kids that I'm willing to go to bat for. You know, I've had several several just college kids that aren't even in a position where they're old enough or experienced enough or even far enough along in college where an internship's possible for them. But they've flown out here to Arizona and have spent time, you know, in our facilities. And I'm willing to hook them up with you know if one of them wants to be a physical therapist like he was, you know. Hey, can I spend time with you? And I'm like, even better, spend time with our physical therapist. I'll vouch for you because you're doing all the right things. Like, I'll go out on a limb for those kids any day. If they show me that they're a good person, they're willing to work hard, and they just want to learn. Like, if you do those three things, um, there's very few people that are going to turn you down. And if people don't answer your emails or your texts or your calls, I've just found that it's because they're busy. It's not because they don't recognize what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, and you hear the same thing. Like, I I listen to, to Gary Vaynerchuk a little bit online. Um, I know Tony Robbins, like to- if you look at Tony Robbins and I'm not a, honestly a, a fan of Tony Robbins. I'm just like, obviously I respect the work he's done, but like his personal speaking style, like doesn't speak to me. But when you look at his story, cause I looked him up and he's like built this huge, you know, like image and he reaches so many people. He's like this world famous speaker. He was just an assistant for another speaker. He doesn't have like some crazy, like psychology background or any of that stuff. He was just like on the coattails of a pretty good speaker when he was a young guy and he learned all the tricks of the trade because he observed them firsthand. And that's the story with so many of these people. And if you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk, which if you're out there in the audience, he's a really, he uses the F word a lot. So your kids, maybe not, but uh, he doesn't use it like an offensive context. He just like says the F word a lot. That's just like his thing. And he, he's not apologetic about it, but he's a business guy. He owns Vayner media in New York. And uh, he just talks about how like, look, like it, it, when he, when people ask him for a career advice, he's like, go find, you want to be a videographer, go find a video person, email them, tell them you'll work for free and like be with them every day and like learn what they do. Like if they're successful, you don't want to be their employee. You want to be with them. And that's why you want to work for free. So you learn what they do. It's like, it'll be worth so much more if you're not paid to do it. Like it's, it's, it seems backwards, but it's a, it's a really common thread that I hear more and more for some of these you know, people that I tend to follow as well. So, and hearing it from you, like it just, it all makes sense. Cause again, like you're a young guy who's like already like pretty deep into, you know, major league organization. And like when I asked your age, when we were off, uh, off air, I was assuming you were closer to 30, but you're closer to 25. So, you know, it, it just, it, it speaks, it speaks for itself, I think. So once you got done, um, getting into minor league baseball, um, what was the adjustment period like? You know, you're, uh, was it tough for guys to uh, listen to you? You know, if you'd only work with high school kids as a background, or if you're a new guy, was there a lot of like, did you have to learn, earn some street cred? <laughs> like, did you have to be mean to like show them who's boss? Like, how was the breaking in process? Because I can imagine that's pretty intimidating. It's, it's, it's funny, man. I the I think the biggest, the hardest adjustment was was for me personally. So 
I've bounced in and out of professional baseball many times, and I've been told by some people that have been in it much longer than I have that, like, hey, if you leave baseball, again, you're never getting back in, and, and thankfully I've had opportunities to get back in. But if I've ever left or ever had any difficulties, for the most part, it's, it's been just personal adjustments with, like, the lifestyle and, and things like that. It's the, the With players, I don't know. I, I don't – I can only speak from my, my half of the relationship with those guys, but I feel like it's been – it's been a lot easier than you would think but i i just don't make it complicated you know i've i've never i learned my i guess that's that's kind of the bonus for me or one of the major benefits that came out of starting to coach at 18 i learned who i was as a coach and i, I continue to learn who i am as a coach and as a professional as i've learned who i am as a person so i haven't tried to be anybody that i'm not i haven't tried to be scott cochran at at alabama or or anybody like that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not the energy guy. I'm not, I'm not, that's why when I spent a year at, at the land high school as their head strength coach, it was the football guy, you know, or football was one of my main sports. Um, I had a hard time being the get back guy and the hype guy. Cause I, I, that's just not me. Um, but, but at the end of the day, like I know, I know who I am as a person, as I, who I am as a coach. So I'm super authentic or I try to be, um, I'm just going to be myself and, and I care about people. Um, I do my best to communicate as well as I possibly can. Um, I've been humbled many times, so it's, it's just shown me that if I don't have an answer for it, you know, I have the opportunity to, to still earn that cred, so to speak, with my athletes by pointing them in the right direction or finding the answer for them. So if that means connecting them with another staff member or somebody else, like I'm not going to let my ego get in the way of them getting better. So, you know, pass them on, refer them out. Um, you know, there, obviously there, there have been situations where the moment and the job have felt way bigger than me, and I felt out of my league, especially coming into this role. At, at, I had just turned 25 when, when I accepted the job here with the Indians, like, and I admitted to them. I said, I feel like I'm way out of my league. But thankfully, all those, all those moments of feeling out of my league, starting at 18 years old, working with kids I had just played with, um, you know, being at Stetson University at 20 and coaching everything up to, like, you know, the – fifth year senior who's 23 ish, you know, um, and then being in pro ball at, you know, at 21 and having, you know, guys that are into their you know, 23, 24, 25 years old at, in the rookie ball level. Like I felt out of my league so many times that that, that was never something I felt uncomfortable with. Um, gotcha. so, so thank, thankfully, like I've just been me and, and so far, you know, I'm blessed to say that guys have been receptive to that. And, and I hope that that style continues to, work as the new generations come up but but i've had like i you know i've said i've had a lot of experience with with younger athletes too so i feel like i can still be relatable to the 18 year old that we draft um while at the same time trying to mold and adapt to the older more veteran guys that, that needed more of a hands-off approach gotcha gotcha and that's always one of my my big questions is you know, you get the, and this is one thing I learned from the Raven strength coach when I interned with him, that at the highest levels, a lot of times you're just trying not to disturb guys' routines. You're not trying to break them because there's a, you know, you don't want to be the guy who tweaked, you know, so-and-so's hamstring who's worth $200 million. Um, and all these guys are pro ball players, right? A lot, even the younger guys are worth a lot of money. So what's, what's the balance that you guys have to strike? Cause I'm sure this is, you know, universal in the whole pro baseball world about training them hard, but not training them too hard. And where do you kind of tend to draw the line mentally with the, the risk and reward of, of, of training intensity or certain exercises? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, and it's one that I, I feel more and more every year, um, just as the role has changed. So, um, you know, when the guys are younger and they, they come in, the, the, the great thing I would say about the Indians is that they understand the bigger picture. The, the perspective is, hey, you know, we, one, we know that we're, we're a, a small to mid-market team. Um, therefore, we would rather invest money in player development uh, probably than other areas like big free agent signings for, for, mo for, the, for the bulk of our, you know, investment. Um, so they've invested in, in our weight room. We've, they've invested in great staff, great technology. Um, and, and, and they've brought in people that have developed programs that are based around like truly developing guys. So when we draft a, a player, um, when we draft a player and they come in and they're 18 or even for 22 and they're coming out of college, like we still know like for that 18 year old that we draft, you know, my boss said this at one point, he's like, Hey, like when it comes down to it, if, if play, if this player, player X 
is 18 years old, even if he does everything right, he's still probably not a big leaguer for four to five years at least. So why not push? Now, you know, you got you can't be reckless. These guys, like you said, they, they are they're commodities, you know, outside of being people first, they're, they're commodities and, and we invest in them. So you want to take care of them. You don't want them to lose playing time. But at the same time, like it is about development. So, you know, um, you know, we'll, we'll train guys here in the summer during our extended spring training and during, uh, during uh, the Arizona league here. So the, so the rookie ball that we have playing out here, we'll train the guys three times a week in the off season. We'll train them for when they're here, have them in the building five days a week. So realistically they're, they're doing things every day. Um, you know, we push, we push hard, you know, for, for the development. Now, like you said, at that higher level, things change a little bit. And I, I feel like that, that's a, that's one of the nuanced parts of, of being in professional sports and I've had to learn it pretty quickly the best that I can and is still learning is when you do get a guy that's a higher level guy in the organization or a, a major league type guy and he's coming in for rehab is, you know, how much, one, how, how much do you give them what you think they need versus what you know they can handle already? Um how much do you deviate from their routines? And then when and how often do you offer that up? So early on, like it is, it is just about uh, just as much about relationship building early on as it would be with an 18 year old, because uh, you know, you definitely don't want to go up to a guy that that's probably had about 15 different strength coaches since he was 18 years old, you know, giving him advice, everything from his off season guys, you know, back home um, to all the strength coaches he's had along the way, everybody's had a great idea for him. So, you just want to make sure that you build that relationship first and then just see if you can help them in any way. And if that just means being support, then you're just support. And that, that oftentimes is, is what I come back to the most for, for our older guys is, Hey, I'm just here to support your process. And you just let me know what you need. Um, and over time, usually there's a relationship built where they start to ask for things and, um, and you're just there to support the best you can. But with the younger guys, definitely, you, you know, you, you still got to push because, we want, you know, one of two things. Like you want this kid to develop to be a big leaguer for, for, for your organization, or you want this kid to become a big leaguer for somebody else's organization for them because you care about them as a person, but also because that probably means they brought you some kind of value back in a trade. So yeah. um, it, it, it is, it's very much business, but it's very much the, the, the personal element too. Yeah. So I'm sure with a lot of these younger kids, and this was a thing that, that I personally it was really hard to figure out is their routine. So I'll give you a quick story that I think st- sums it up for me. But when I was my rookie season, I was coming off of Tommy John because I got Tommy John to end my college career. And I was trying to like stay healthy. So I had this very rigorous, you know, routine in general. But I especially did tons of forearm stuff because when you do you go through the Tommy John rehab, it's a lot of forearm exercises because that's where, you know, that's a, the main compartment where that surgery is done. And so, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to have the strongest forearms and, and make sure, you know, my elbow is really well supported because I always sort of, you know, envision the forearm muscles being like the bodyguards for my, my UCL. And so I did this, this very strenuous routine and my velocity was down. And so this is early in this, in my, in my rookie season, I'm also adjusting to pitching every fifth day instead of every once a week. Uh, my, I was going hundred to 120 every time out. And so my velocity was just like down one time, then it'd be, you know, be 88 to 91 start, then it'd be 87 to 91, the next start, then it'd be 90, 92, then it'd be 86 to 90. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I finally realized that I, the amount of forearm exercises I did between starts and when I did them had a major effect on my velocity. So when I started cutting back on that, or just doing it, you know, I did, I cut back in both volume and I did it earlier before the start. So on like day two instead of day three, my velocity started to normalize. And then for the rest of the season, it took me about half of that summer. Uh, my velocity was the same, like every time out. Uh, and that was a really tough lesson to learn. And it just took a lot of tinkering. Um, so how do you guys help young players who have to f- figure that out? How do you help them shorten that learning curve where it maybe doesn't take them you know, 10 starts like it did me, where maybe it could take them three or four, or maybe there's very little curve at all. But what, what role do you play in building guys' routines? Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's an awesome, awesome example. I appreciate you sharing that because just before I dive into that, just to digress a little bit, it's funny because that resonates so much with me. You know, of course, you know, with 
with baseball being the way it is right now, you know, Tommy John and, and UCL repairs, injections, reconstructions are, are pretty prevalent. <laughs> so, you know, we get those guys coming in it's, and you get a very repetitive process with them in that you see guys come in, um, and as they are able to do more in their training, still prior to throwing, they start to build out these routines, and they and, and more becomes better. And, and there always becomes a point where they're probably four to six weeks out from throwing, and you just kind of let them know, hey, like we're getting near that inflection point where you're, it's in your best interest to start backing off in here and not doing quite so much extra work on top of what I'm already giving you. I know you're bored out of your mind. I know you're getting cabin fever. I know you're sick of rehab, so you're just trying to use this as your outlet and develop as best you can before you throw. I get it, but we got to start to back it down. And, and you know, you have some that will do it, and then you have some that will keep pushing. And it's usually by that second, third, fourth week of throwing where they start to ask you, like, hey, like, I know it's my off day and I would normally do this, but would you – should I still do it? And, like, I know that they're very – you know, they're coming to me basically so I can give them permission to take a day off. <laughs> And, yeah. and so, you know, that's, that's when it's always like, all right, there it is. You know, now, now we, we have a little bit of understanding. So of, of recovery and how that plays. So it's, it's, it's funny because it's, it's, ha- that, that's the process that's I think happened to everybody that's gone through it. But um, in terms of building routines, though, our players and our staff, when they get onboarded into the organization, um, they, they get a lot, they get some lessons that are very consistent between both players and staff. And it's, and it's some of the themes of, of, of being a Cleveland Indian. And, and one of them is, is, is routines. So um, with Corey Kluber, obviously being a prime example of somebody who's so routine oriented, that's, that's the mold that we're trying to build with all of our athletes when they come in. So uh, for us, um, you know, we have, we have, um, you know, we have a huge emphasis on building routines and that from day one, we start with that. So uh, when our players, let's say get drafted and they first come into the organization, um, they'll start in Arizona and regardless of, what round they were drafted in, uh, they're going to stay in Arizona until they've checked off a certain number of boxes that tell us that they're physically and mentally ready to move on to the to to short season ball or a full season affiliate within that first half season of their of their career. So if they need any physical development or if they have any medical red flags, they're going to spend a significant amount of time in Arizona during that that first stint. Um, or if we feel like they need a deloading from playing because they played through their college season. Um, and they've been going for, you know, eight months straight, um, they'll, they'll stay in Arizona. So during that time, we, we actually institute what's essentially like a block zero program or a foundations program where everything from the S and C side, where we're building them up, teaching them our building blocks of, of what makes, you know, what movements and parts of our program are important. So everything from the squat, lunge, hinge, push, pull, like just like really any, anybody else's program how we go about coaching them, teaching them. We build them from the ground up on that. Um, we teach them, you know, everything from plyos to, to the, some of the things in running that, that we expect from them and what they'll learn in the coming years. But then we also have like a, a classroom curriculum for them that we're building out from year to year. And we started implementing this my, my first year w- with the organization. But uh, we essentially, we, we harp on or we, we do extra time uh, once or twice a week on hydration, nutrition, sleep, recovery, prep routines. Um, we help them build out their own prep routines, and uh, and we spend weeks going through curriculums of that so that they they start to learn, you know, why it's important, so the why behind it all. But then we also have the application process where they, you know, we help them build out a routine based upon the assessments that we have on them, um, that, or that we collect on them, and the things that we're seeing. And then by the end of their first half season, we're hoping that they have a routine that they can at least start with or that they've started to build their own routine and find things that work for them in, in terms of prep and, and also start to appreciate all the other things that, that go into making um, a successful ball player and a, a successful person. So it's definitely, there's a lot of application in teaching, but there's also a lot of just like, you know, classroom time. Like you're going to come in for a half hour, 45 minutes, and we're going to learn why recovery is important um, and why prep routines are important. And then we're going to talk through, you know, how to best uh, get you on a plan that's individualized for your needs. Yeah, and I bet you have, and I, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this, but uh, I'm sure you could probably define for the audience uh, what an OFP guy is. Yeah, I can. <laughs> you don't have yeah, to say it yeah. out loud, own, but yeah, own, go ahead. Own freaking program. Own freaking program. <laughs> yeah, so how do you, I'm sure with today, and it's a good thing, like kids know more f- younger than ever. I mean, the amount a 16-year-old kid could acquire from, you know, 
the internet blogosphere, from YouTube, from Instagram. I mean, they can learn more than I learned at 25 at 16 now. So how do you handle these guys that come in who have their own freaking program, who maybe think that they're smarter than the Indians or any other team, and say, hey, this is what works for me, when in reality, I know, like, I knew a lot going into pro ball, but I didn't know very much when I, like, now that it's all said and done, it took me a long time to adapt to being a pro, how much I could throw. It was very different than my college experience, like the throwing volumes, playing every day, training every day, you know, how to lift when I, I might be up and I might pitch in relief three days in a row. It just gets really complex. How do you get guys to buy in to saying, no, we have a routine for you when they're going to maybe push back and be like, I don't want to be a cookie cutter. I don't want to be, you know, I'm an individual because there's definitely merit to that. And that's not, it's not wrong to feel that way, but there's also listening to your elders and listening to people that have done it before and listening to people who can guide you through unknown waters. So um, what could you tell us about that maybe battle that you're uh, you fight each, each year with new guys? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, and it's definitely, it's definitely something where I think depending on the organization uh, and their philosophy is, is going to dictate a lot of how that's handled. I'll say this, you, you're absolutely right. Like I think ki- kids or players today as, as they come in, the access that they have the information, one of two things are going to happen. Either they really do know a lot or they're going to think they know a lot. And either one of those things is basically like equitable to, you know, they're, they're equal to each other because, even if he doesn't know a lot and he thinks he knows a lot, he's probably going to have a harder time quickly buying into what you have to say all the same. Um, so really, I mean, it, it all comes down to this. Like you, you just can't BS these guys anymore because they'll fact check you and, 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 or they can, you know, yeah, that's a good um, point. or they'll just, or they'll just, or they'll just turn you off, you know? So even if they don't call you out on something, you know, they'll just want to do their own thing. So, you know, we, 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 we built a brand new weight room um, after my first year with the organization. It is, it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's the best weight room that I've, that I've been fortunate enough to have. Um, we have incredible staff and we're staffing this facility year round at this point. We want guys to be in house with us. That being said, uh, I think, I think two things come with that one, like you can't be cookie cutter. So that's where organizational philosophy and what your content is does matter because if you are cookie cutter, then I think you, you probably just need to know that you're going to have a lot of pushback. Um, but uh, you might really believe in your program and it might work for a good amount of your guys. And those are the guys that show up and that's who you work with. Um, for us, you know, we've made a transition this year to, to try to be really um, as individualized as possible. The, the hard part about that is when you have 180 players or more actually um, that you you spend the majority of your time with them during the season when there's competing demands. And then in the off season, you might see them for a week at a time or three weeks at a time, and then they'll leave and then they'll come back for another camp or, or you may not see them at all, or they might be playing winter ball internationally. So um, to individualize for those guys, I become a challenge and, and, and you do it, you do it the best you can. And I think this year, like for us, like you uh, speaking for myself, as, as I try to, to, to plan for these guys, is you know that year one is going to have a lot of hiccups and it's going to have a lot of issues as you learn to individualize for these guys and give them the best that you can. But at the same time, like you just develop that over years so that the quality gets better. But at the end of the day, like you just can't BS them anymore. You, you have to, you have to be able to provide them with something. But, but, but on the, on the flip side of that, something that, that I've found just to be honest with you is sometimes just, you know, you, you got to be honest with yourself. I mean, I don't think any person who's, who's rational or, or has been in this long enough will say that they have the best program in the world or that they can provide everything. And if, I think if you could, if you say that to your athlete, or if you believe that, then you're, you're probably, you're a little misled yourself or misguided yourself because, you know, at the end of the day, if, if a guy wants to bring in a program from somewhere else uh, during the off season, um, you know, what, what we end up doing is, is a very similar situation for me uh, that I spoke on earlier is, is I say, Hey, I'm here to support, I'm here to support you. But what I would like to do is, is partner with who, you know, trainer or whoever that, that you're, you're currently working with, because let's say a certain player is, is there for your, you know, we had a November performance camp. Well, that was three weeks long. This kid had just spent the previous seven weeks back home with his trainer. He's going to spend the next two to three weeks back home with his trainer. 
and he may or may not come back for the next camp. He may spend the rest of the offseason there. So it's, it's my job, rather than to hold my ground and say it's, it's all or nothing, you do this or you stay home, we'll bring you in, you know, we'll walk through your program, you know, we'll let you know if there's things that we don't love or we think that could potentially be, you know, non-beneficial to you. Um, but we're going to partner with your with your your coach, with your trainer. We're going to try to learn more, and we're going to try to just work as one team to help you. Because at the end of the day, that player needs to be prepared for what is expected in spring training and then during the season. Um, now, when they're in-house in season, they're doing our programs. But again, like we're doing our best to individualize for each guy. And it's a partnership. It's not a one-way street. It's, it's I'm working with all of my players, and each of these each strength coach at each affiliate is working with all of his players to provide them the best care possible. So um, I think that's how we handle it. And is it perfect? Probably not. But, but I think if you cut the ego out of it and you, and you try to be transparent and authentic with the guys, that's, you know, that's, that's the best service you could do for them. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm sure it's, like you said, so many people to individualize for. And, uh, I mean, like in our academy here, like we individualize each program, but it's a, it's a mountain of work. So I can definitely understand how there's, limitations and there's also you know you trying to communicate as best you can to just to get everyone on the same page which and then you're going to have the best possible care for a guy who's not necessarily doing your program in the in the off season so i, I guess a question i have is uh, in addition to the physical stuff you know it seems like it's starting to gain gain traction but uh, i think americans still lag way behind you know the rest of the world and again like i studied philosophy in college so i know a lot about like the how, what they do in the Far East and and overseas as far as like the mental side of the game. But what do you guys do to support players, not only from like a mental conditioning standpoint, but also from uh, a mental health uh, perspective? Because baseball, I think more than any other sport, will just beat you down and down. And it's such a culture of machismo that I doubt many guys will speak up. Uh, I, I like I know for a fact that very few of us do. And you know, in, in my book that I've been working on. Like I know that I'm I'm sharing some of my personal thoughts about the game and and my retirement and like how I really felt about it that I haven't told like pretty much anyone. Like it's not all right to be like, yeah, I was like sobbing when I when I retired. Like who says like who says that? But it's a real thing. And and guys get crushed by slumps. They go through depression. They go through anxiety. They go through breakups and family stuff. So what do you guys what do you do to support guys on the mental side? Yeah, I, the awesome question. Uh, well, in, in terms of just like mental performance, so uh, you know we're very fortunate with the Indians under our you know performance team umbrella. So we have our, our strength and conditioning, we have our uh, physical therapy, athletic training, uh, nutrition, and then we we have mental performance. So we have mental performance coaches. Uh, we have a psychologist with the organization as well. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities for guys to. Uh, when we when we talk about routines and we talk about a lot of the things that when guys first get onboarded with the Indians and learn about the Indians' way, like one of those things is having a growth mindset um, and and learning from failure and in and, and those things. So we try to instill in these guys, especially early on, that like it's okay to fail, it's okay to not be perfect, it's okay to make mistakes. Like that's where the growth happens. And and I'll, you know, I'll be the first to tell you personally that. that I'm not a big self-help guy. Like I'm not a, I'm not big on thinking positively all the time. That's just, that's just not how my brain works. Um, but I am about thinking in terms of practicality and what's realistic. And at the end of the day, like our guys are in a very fortunate position, but they're going to face adversity in so many ways. They're, they're going to face adversity. Like you mentioned on the field, one day their career will end, hopefully later rather than sooner. Um, a lot of these kids are moving away from home for the first time. Uh, there's money now being, you know, thrown at them. They now have money, relationships. There's going to be so much adversity, but there are opportunities to grow um, and, and that's that and, and, and grow stronger and more resilient. So I think it's the best way to look at it. But I think like you touching, you touching on that though, I, I think it's it's so important uh, for me personally. It's kind of a it's a personal mission outside of of just sport performance and something that I really am passionate about is is the mental health uh, side of really just life, life in general for, for, for general pop. And like my, my, you know, my life is centered around athletes. So, you know, I, I would love to use my platform for the opportunity to help athletes specifically, but realistically help anybody who's struggling with mental health, because it's, it's honestly, it's, it's a, it's, it's been a very personal uh, matter for me as well. It's, you know, I've dealt with depression since I was a little kid, man, since I was probably 10 or 11 years old, I remember. And, 
and not really understanding what it was and, and then going to a counselor when I was in high school and a counselor can't legally tell you what or ethically tell you what you're dealing with, but they say, well, you know, it looks like you have depression. So then, you know, you carry that around and it just, you know, for me for, for a while felt like a crutch. Maybe I was just being a baby. Maybe I bad at adulting as I got older, you know, maybe I'm just soft. And like you said, it's just like trying to, try to have that, you know, machismo and, and, and be somebody that I'm, I'm not like that was, that was such a battle for me. And I, and I know I'm not alone. I, I would, I would be naive to think that I'm the only person who goes through those same struggles mentally. So the more I think that we can talk about it, be open about our struggles and what we've gone through. Um, not that every person has to share their story publicly, but those that are willing to share publicly are the ones that could potentially hopefully, um, you know, uh, encourage others to go get the help that they need, you, you know, and to open up to somebody, even if it is privately. Yeah. So, I mean, have, I mean, do you see it? I mean, as a guy who's, who's been through it, do you see guys potentially silently suffering? Like, do you look at, you know, your left fielder out there and you're just watching him on and off the field and you think, man, he might, he might be going th through something. Um, would you reach out to a guy like that? Or, or what is the culture like where, um, how do you get through if you feel like someone might need help, but maybe they don't want to seek it? Yeah, it's, it's funny because I feel like um, har hardship and struggle, whether it's like mental health or just like in life struggles, like I, I think it gives you this this unique perspective. And I think we all get our own version of that as, as we go through tough times where you just have this different outlook on life that you get uh, that's unique to the person next to you. You know, you see the world a little bit differently. And, and sometimes I, I honestly, I, I I feel like I can see it on people. You know, you could tell when somebody's been through something. I don't know. I can't tell you that I could read mental health off of somebody, but, but you can tell when somebody might be going through a hard time. And I think the best thing we can do is just be supportive. And sometimes like that's not necessarily reaching out and say, Hey, I'm worried about you, but just being there. So like a hand on somebody's shoulder for an extra second when you pass by them in the hallway um, the text message to let them know that like, Hey, you're doing a great job or I care about you. Um, those kinds of things, like uh, what I've learned from my own personal experience is how supportive and life changing your teammates and your, your, and, and the people around you can be without them probably ever knowing that you're struggling. So even if you don't know, I think it's, it's just, this overall, this, this overall like compassion and empathy for other people. Like if, as long as you always have that, you have the opportunity to support somebody that's going through a hard time because I'll tell you what, man, I, just to be completely honest, I, you know, I went through, you know, had depression since I was 11, 12 years old, went through some hard times, but to be completely honest, probably 2015, 2016, as my professional career was taking off up until hell, like the end of 2017, as I was in, you know, the best role of my life, just getting started here with the Indians, it was the hardest I'd ever had to fight in my entire life to deal with depression and nobody knew it nobody nobody around me as far as i know knew it i didn't tell anybody but my players here with the indian the staff that's around me um with me being so far away from home and not having family here I and mean, my family's so important to me like they they so my teammate pulled me through it without them ever knowing and all they were all they did is they said like you know they, they didn't know they didn't know they were doing that but, but but by being empathetic for always being there for me just interacting with me they supported me through some of the hardest times so i think you can you can be supportive for somebody even if you don't see them struggling and if you are and if you do see them struggling if you think something's there like it's definitely worth reaching out to them to, to see if, if everything's okay. And if you are legitimately concerned about them, maybe reaching out to somebody else who might be able to help them. Um, you know, it, it's a sensitive area. It's, it's hard to talk about. Um, you don't want to ever feel like you're outing somebody, but if you're worried about somebody, the last thing you ever want to do is wonder what if. Um, so I'm, I'm an advocate for, for anybody who's struggling just to, to get the help that you need. And if you think somebody else is struggling, just, just be there for them. And, and, and if, if they need more more dire help than that and then be the person that be, be the person that tries to connect the dots and connect them with somebody that can help them. Yeah. I mean, and I've never, I haven't been through it in that sense, but just in like the everyday grind. And that's why I can imagine it's so hard because even the little stuff as a, as a ball player, like you just don't talk about very much because you don't want to, you don't want to show weakness. 
And that's just like, like, I remember my last season, I was sitting in the bullpen with my buddy, Kevin, who might be listening to this. So Vance, if you're out there and he and I just talked honestly about like, we were both pitching bad. And when you pitch bad, it just like hurts your soul. And when you start to see your ERA climb, where you know you're getting to the point where you could get released any day, and I was at that level, I was pitching like a, like a seven or eight ERA for like a couple weeks before I finally got released. It just like every day you're like quieter because you can't get your mind off it, but you can't really talk to your teammates about it because you don't want to be a whiner and and no one needs to hear about it. Like, you know, when I had elbow pain constantly through most of my career, I didn't I didn't need to share with everybody. Uh, but at times it would have been nice to just like just vent about it. But no one cares. Like they, I don't need to know if your arm hurts. We're just going to both pitch, right? You know, and and it, it there's no excuses for for your job. Like if you sign up to go out to the mound and pitch, you're a hundred percent. It doesn't matter if you're eighty five percent. Doesn't matter if your arm's throbbing. If you're pitching, you're a hundred percent. So that's the culture as it is, and that's just like surface stuff. That's just your stats in a kid's game. You know, and we still don't even want to talk about that. So I can imagine how hard it must be if it, you're going through real stuff that you just you could just take that to the, you know, just take it with you and not give it to share it with anybody and just continue to suffer and suffer and, and spiral down. So, you know, I know my last season I was uh, I was living with my girlfriend at the time. It was the first time I had a girlfriend uh, during my pro career. And. That was another hard thing because I would go out, pitch terrible, see myself like, okay, I could probably get released any day. And now I'm going to be, you know, sent home. So that's going to break us up basically. Like I'm not going to be able to be here anymore with her. So I go home to her every day, like try to put on a happy face where I know like I could get axed tomorrow. She doesn't know that. So I just like push through it. But like I remember the, like the last day where I was like very certain because I, I, I came in, gave up single, single, single to load the bases didn't get a single out, got yanked. And then I actually did that two days in a row. And the first day my teammate came in and punched out the side for me. It was amazing. The next day, like, you can't expect that. And like, I mean, he was awesome, like getting me out of jams. But the second day it was single, single, single from Dan, Dan gets yanked. And then he gave up a grand slam, totally not his fault. Like he was pitching his butt off. Uh, But as I watched that grand slam go, I was just like, that's it. Like, that's, that's the end. Like, I've just been making everything messy. I pitched terrible for a month. My shoulder's killing me. And I went home that night, and I just was like, listen, I'm getting released. And it was hard. And it, and it was just like I felt better. But it was also just deflating because that was just like the way it was. And no one talks about that stuff. And that's just like, again, that's like silly stuff. That's like I'm not good at a sport. You know what I mean? Like, that's not real life stuff. And even that is just really but, but, hard. But, so I can imagine. And I don't... I don't mean to cut you off, man, but 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 definitely don't minimize what what that what that is though. Like that that is real life, right? Like you and I both have, have strung our identities to to baseball. Like you know, we, I think I said that before we we got on air. Like I feel like I'm every bit as much of a of a baseball guy as the guys that I work with every day. I just wasn't as good, so I didn't play as long. But I've been attached to baseball since I was four years old. I don't know how many I've spent more days on a field than I've spent off it since I could walk. You know, so. So for me, like I, I can under, I can identify. I, I can't relate. I've never been there, but to to struggle at the sport and not, not know if you're gonna, you know, when also it's you know it's potentially a livelihood for a lot of people. Like to not know, you know, if you're gonna get to continue to to keep that part of you and not know what the next chapter holds. Like that's hard, man. That's that's heavy stuff. It doesn't matter that it's a kid's game. Like the context, the context is the same. So the struggles that that anybody goes through on the field. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day that um, they actually, they opened up to me a little bit about something that they were going through and, and they, they told me that their, their family didn't really believe in, in mental illness. And I was like, well, hell, call, call it whatever you want. You know, at the end of the day, like going through a hard time, it could be situational. It could be because of your environment and the circumstances around you. It could be biochemical. It could be whatever, whatever, you know, theory that we want to put to it. But at the end of the day, like it's real because this is real life. And, and if you, if somebody goes into a funk because they pitch bad and they don't know what the next step is, like that's that's your life. Um, and so the the go- the point of this isn't to put more weight on something that should be a you know like you said, a kids game. I'm not trying to make it feel heavy, but I am trying to, to to emphasize the importance of like being able to talk through things as they happen might be the difference in how you handle it. You know, and, and I'm hoping, like you said, you know, being able to open up to your girlfriend and 
then and say like, hey, this is what's about to happen, you know, hope or, or, or had you gone back, you know, and, and been able to talk to somebody, even if it's just your best friend and just be, be honest about things, you know, that might at least make the experience a little less uh, unpleasant, if not help you through, you know, work through what the next steps might be or, or how to handle the situation. Because if I've learned one thing, it's, you know, from, from getting help myself, you know, getting, getting professional help is, is there's nothing wrong with that because we need somebody that's removed from the situation sometimes to give us a more clear perspective because a lot of the things that, that come from, a lot of the negatives that come from the situations that we're in are self-derived because we base it on our own biases and our own previous experiences. You know, um, if, if, every, if every time you stepped outside of your front door, it was raining, you know, you might think that you're bringing rain every single day, where in reality, you might just live in Seattle. You know, yeah. you might have just moved there and you had no idea. So sometimes you need somebody to, to, to sit there and tell you like, hey, this, this, you know, the way you're thinking about it is, is, is warped. It's, it's a little wrong. It's a little distorted. Let's peel some layers back. Um, and so whether that's professional help or just, you know, a best friend to talk to you and say like, hey, man, like, you're going to be fine. Like, you've built a life and, and, and it'll go on with or without baseball or, or your career will go on or, or you'll still have relationships. Like, those things help. Um, so uh, I, I, think it's, I think that's really what it all comes down to is just knowing. You know, sometimes you, you keep the battle to yourself, and that's the best way that they're handled. But other times, if, if you feel like you need to, to, to talk it out with somebody, get help, or, or just work through some things, um, there's nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong in, in asking for help or going to a friend and, and confiding in them. It's totally okay. You're not, you're not weak. You're not soft. You're real. You're just a person. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. all. Yeah, no, and even like you saying that, like you at times need to feel permission to because look, I'm I'm very aware, and again, like I've been recounting all of these stories in my book, and sometimes I'm like, God, am I just whining? But you have to like, you just kind of like gave me permission to like look, feel the way you feel about it. Like like my dad told me a story. I asked my dad. Uh, recently like how much baseball he played as a kid and I, I know he wasn't like a big baseball player but for whatever reason he was like yeah we would go to the sandlot but uh one of my friends he couldn't play and I'm like why he's like because he didn't have shoes and that just like broke my heart and I'm like I'm yeah. whining about giving up grand slams and this there was like a little boy in rural Oklahoma who wanted to play baseball and he couldn't because he didn't have shoes it's like what the hell are my problems you know what I mean and when you think that way you can eat, you just like you never have a problem. Like I'm aware that I'm like a healthy white American male who has a college education, who's smart, who is athletic. I got to play pro baseball. Like I have not one thing to cry about. But at the end of the day, like we still feel the way we feel, and it's hard to sometimes make sense of of what we can allow ourselves uh, as far as just like certain emotions. I don't know. It, it, it is a complex thing because when you look at the grand scheme of things. My life is pretty great. Your life is pretty great, but it doesn't make us feel any different than the way we we feel. Right. Well, no, that's 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 the complexity of it, right? And that's that's the battle. I think I have a lot is it because a lot of you know a lot of things are solved by reminding yourself of what you're thankful for and what you should be grateful for. And and and, and a lot of times, like that's why like a, a thankfulness journal like is something that some people do and it works for them and be. be because it, it gives you the perspective to realize that you have a lot of things that are, that are good in your life. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, your emotions are real and you still have to take care of yourself because, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, I still wake up and I, I still face depression and anxiety every day. And no matter how I go to bed at night or how my day goes, which it always thankfully ends up well, you know, I, I have a great day at work and I have, I, I'm very lucky to be in the position that I'm at and, have the family that I have, but there's still that hard part of every day that is, is challenging and I can't explain to you why. And I wish I knew the reason, but I'll say that I've come to learn so much more about myself from that, from talking it through with other people and just being introspective with myself and just starting to understand things. And it, you know, I used to try to be a positive thinker, you know, and, and like I said earlier on in the, in the podcast, like I, you know, a positive versus negative doesn't work for me because I'll always find a way to turn a positive to a negative at some point. But if I remove myself from the situation a little bit and I just think realistically, logically, practically, like you said, I've you know we have a lot of reasons to be thankful and and 
at the end of the day, like most of the negatives in our lives can be remedied by simple actions. Like for example, you know, like I love where I'm from and I'm homesick all the time, but it was really bad when I first moved out here. And, and one of the things that helped me the most was just knowing that I could go on Expedia.com and look up a plane ticket and I could book that flight right now. And I could quit my job if I wanted to. There's ramifications for that, but I'm not stuck here. Like I'm, I have options. I, you know, I have an opportunity yeah. to take my life in my own hand. I'm, my life isn't crushing me. I'm not suffocated by it. I'm in control of things. So, you know, when we do feel the way we feel, yeah, like thank, be thankful for everything, but even just look at it practically. Like, you know, we are all fortunate living in the United States of America and having the opportunities that we have. Like, we have our lives in our hands, and um, you know, you you, you got to make the most with that. Um, but before you don't have that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, this, uh, I hate to wrap this up because I think this was a really, really good, deep conversation that I think needs to be talked about more, you know, like not only like, I, I think your story's awesome, just like the hard work and the unpaid work and the, uh, just the, the passion for coaching. Like if you want to be a coach, you've got to put in the time and all that. But you know, I, I don't know that I get many opportunities to just talk candidly about some of the things that I went through and then to hear someone else really open up and talk about like what their real life is like and struggles that they face. And that's what um, I really appreciate about you and opening up here on the show. And because I know like there's other people who go through what you're going through and there's other people that have been through or will go through the stuff that I went through on the player side. Like it's just it's just how the game is. Baseball is soul crushing and amazing but mostly mm -hmm. mostly soul crushing <laughs> so um uh as we wrap up is there any last uh things you'd like to impart any wisdom uh and then also if you've got social media which i know you do i'd love for you to share it and i'll definitely link to it so if you want to follow ryan uh, and i highly suggest you do i'll put his twitter handle and all his other handles in the uh the description here on youtube and uh in podcast land so take it ryan I, uh, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, and like I said, I, I earlier, I really appreciate you having me, uh, having me on here just, just, just spending time to talk shop with me because, uh, cause you're a great baseball person. You're a great guy. And I've followed you for, for a long time as well. So I appreciate the opportunity. Definitely. Uh, if, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, Twitter's probably the best way. Uh, so I appreciate you linking me up, uh, there. Uh, I also, I'm super busy. I tend to be really bad at getting back sometimes, but persistence always wins. And I, the same thing I tell, uh, even people that are close to me, like, you know, if you text me once or email me once, I may look at it and say, okay, like, I want to give that a thoughtful response. I'll get to it later. And then it just slides down the inbox. So, you know, go ahead and be persistent, keep reaching out. But like the, the big thing I want to say, man, um, I just hope that anybody, you know, that does listen and may, may have their own story, their own struggle, their own things that they're working through, just, just own yourself. Um, you know, every day you get the opportunity to, to, to be, you and there's only you're the only version of you that's out there so be the best version you can be this isn't a peppy motivational speech it's it's just a fact that you're incredibly unique and and you should own that and 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 people will love you for your transparency um you, whether you feel like you're alone or not you have a support system around you whether it's family friends um or even if it's somebody that you don't know there's always an opportunity for somebody to to be there for you or for you to invest in other people because if, if you're having trouble finding your purpose or your why simply start investing in other people i mean it's, it's the best thing that you could ever do so um that's that's all i think i can end up with but I, i'm glad to i'm glad to uh pick up a conversation with anybody that wants to reach out and like i said i, I really appreciate you spending some time to talk some shop with me awesome well everyone thank you uh thank you for listening ryan thanks again for being here and don't forget uh, if you've enjoyed the show, share it with someone, especially this episode. Like, I think this is really going to be something that could help some people. So if you know someone who struggles with some of the stuff that we talked about, especially on the mental side, you know, send it along and uh, let them hear firsthand from Ryan. And I think uh, this could potentially make a good impact on some people. And if it impacts one person, then today was worth it. So, Ryan, thanks again. And we will see you here next week on Dear Baseball Gods.